Ground Control, this is Major Tom with the first math lick in our series in Understanding Propulsion where we're going to talk about thrust. So before we talk about thrust, it'd be a good idea to kind of just understand kind of what thrust is and the best way to do that is to see it. And so I have a little video here of a 5,000 pound thrust rocket motor that I designed and tested recently. Um, and we can actually experience thrust. So why don't we do that? Two, one, one ignition. So, so clearly we had some guys in the bunker there with us who had never experienced thrust before. It's very exciting. Um, but where does it come from? Well, to really understand thrust, what we need to do is we need to actually understand Newton's laws of motion. Right? And so there's Newton up there. Um, and this paper here in the corner, the, these are his, his, uh, his writings uh, about the mathematical... Uh, relationships that uh, describe a philosophy of the behavior of nature or the principles of nature as he calls it philosophia naturalis principia mathematica which he wrote in 1687 a long time ago right so um, but it turns out that these laws of motion which many of us were taught in science classes and physics classes in high school or college or maybe we learned from uh, Khan Academy um, it turns out that the cases most of us were, ta were taught about these aren't exactly what Newton said. And this is part of the struggle that people have in trying to understand thrust. But let's go through them step by step, and I will try to point out uh, those differences, and then we'll actually try to come up uh, with a, a version of Newton's laws of motion that will actually help us better understand thrust, and we can use them uh, to come up with a, an equation to describe thrust, which we can use to des uh, actually design rocket motors with, right? Uh, or thrusters or propulsion systems for spacecraft, right? So Newton's first law basically says every body persists in its state of being at rest or of moving uniformly straight forward, except insofar as it is compelled to change its state by force and press. So translating that into stuff that everybody kind of can speak in terms of common English, what Newton's basically saying there is every body persists, every object, right? that is at rest, a state of being at rest, or moving uniformly in a straight forward motion, right? In other words, it's moving forward. So every object at rest, or every object moving uniformly in a straight line, will stay at rest, or stay moving uniformly in a straight line, uniformly meaning at a constant velocity, unless a force is acted upon it, right? And if a force acts on it, then we're gonna see a change, either in its state of rest, or in its direction, it won't be going straight forward anymore, or maybe its velocity might increase, right? Pretty straightforward. Newton's second law is where we start to get a little bit of a deviation from the way we were taught it in most of our classes or places that we've read it in books. In those environments, we've always kind of been taught, well, you know, what's Newton's second law? Well, Newton's second law is F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. And while that's true, that's a special case of what Newton said, right? What Newton actually said in his second law is that the change of momentum of a body is proportional to the impulse impressed on the body and happens along the straight line on which the impulse is impressed. Two key words in there, momentum and impulse, right? There's a math flick uh, that we talk about impulse in terms of how it's used to actually move a spacecraft or a launch vehicle, and you can take a look at that to better understand what that means in terms of designing launch vehicles and moving spacecraft around in space. Uh, but an impulse effectively is a force applied over a period of time, right? And what Newton's really talking about here is that force applied over a unit of time, right, um, actually creates a change in momentum, right? So let's write that up. Right? So the force right, applied over a unit of time, right, dt, oh, pardon me, that's not here, it's up here. That force applied over a unit of time, it should be times, right? So force times a small, this is d, the differential, a small unit amount of time, right? That is equal to the change in momentum, 
right? In other words, force, as defined really by Newton's second law in a general case, is the rate of change of momentum of an object over the rate of change of time, right? It's a little bit different than F equals MA, right? Um, F equals MA, right? Here we're talking about mass and acceleration. Here he's talking about a change in momentum. So obviously there's a translation that occurs here. We're going to talk about that in a minute, right? But this is really, right here, this is really what Newton said in his second law. And it's really important to keep this in mind, particularly when you're working with thrust and thinking about rocket motors and propulsion systems for space vehicles, right? Now, Newton's third law is the way we've classically described rocket motors and space vehicles and thrust, right? And we remember our physics classes, and everybody would say, well, what's Newton's third law? Oh, for every action, there's always an equal and opposite reaction. Well, that's pretty much exactly what he said, right? And of course, uh, most of our physics classes always like to talk about things in terms of two bodies interacting with each other, right? I mean, I think Khan Academy, when they talk about Newton's third law, they have like a fist and they have some guy's face. And so the, you know, one body is the fist and it's interacting with the guy's face, right? And, and Newton talks about that. He says the forces on those two bodies act on each other, but they're always equal, what those forces are, and they're always directed in opposite directions. And of course, when we give examples in our physics classes, you know, we talk about Newton's third law in terms of like a rocket, right? So a rocket emits an exhaust, that's, a, that's an action in one direction, and it creates a reaction, that that, that rocket actually, you know, uh, its velocity changes in the opposite direction, and we always say, well, that's, you know, an example of thrust in a rocket motor is Newton's third law. Um, actually, no, actually Newton's second law is what describes thrust, though Newton's third law is correct in how it's talking about the action and reaction that's occurring to actually create that thrust, right? So let's kind of take a look at this in review because we're going to have to come up with a different set of mathematical relationships to understand thrust force in terms of our rocket motor system. Uh, and here's why. Uh, again, let me make sure I got my pen, right? Is it is that when we talked about a physics before with Newton's second law, it's always been for a constant mass system, right? We've had some mass, M, right? right? And, and we have an outside amount of energy that's coming, maybe somebody's finger, right? And it's, so it's got all the energy coming from burning sugars in our body, pushing our muscles. And we create a force with that finger that comes in from outside the system. This green box is the system. We're talking about what happens to the mass as it sits on this magical frictionless platform we always have in our physics classes. I've never seen one, uh, but it sounds good to me. There's no friction. I'd love to have one of those for my car. I get better gas mileage. But anyway, we have this outside force, and it comes in here, and it, it, it comes in from outside the system with energy, and it pushes on this mass, and it, right, and it creates an acceleration, right? And that acceleration it creates a change in velocity, right? At, at some time Q, it's got a velocity versus the time that when we actually put the force on it, maybe V1, and that's going to act at time 2, right? Minus the time that we had, whatever time it was, that the, before the finger kind of came in and pushed it, right? And so that acceleration is that change in velocity per unit time, right? And so we've described that in the traditional form, uh, we've recognized Newton's second law as force is equal mass times acceleration. Okay, great. Our rocket motor is a little bit different. Here, we've got this magical rocket motor here, and what we do with this magical rocket motor is we have a closed system, right? There's no magic finger coming from the outside into the system and applying a force. Everything's happen, happening inside our system. We've basically got a solid, a fuel, and an oxidizer, right? And uh, uh, we combust that, and it creates some gases, right? It creates water gases, it creates CO2, and it creates some heat, right? And we know uh, from uh, our chemistry classes that there's a relationship with gases where pressure times the volume for any gas is basically equal to the number of molecules in that volume uh, times some constant times the temperature of that system, right? Um, and in terms of our rocket motor here, we're creating heat, right? So we're driving up temperature, 
right? And we're creating more molecules of gas, more molecules than we had before when we combust them. Uh, we always get more number of molecules, so we're increasing the number of molecules. And so by driving up the temperature and driving up the number of molecules, we drive up the pressure, right? And so this chemical energy that's in here in terms of this oxidizer gets converted into mechanical energy in terms of pressure. And that pressure causes that gas to kind of go zooming because it wants to get out of there to an area of lower pressure, right? And what we have happen here is it actually exerts, you know, like maybe one molecule, one differential molecule of mass that comes out here. And the mass of our rocket motor changes from what it was before, which was M, minus the small amount that actually gets kicked out, right? right? Um, and, and the net result of that is that action, uh, as this kicks out, as this gas accelerates in here, um, it comes out at some speed U, right? Its velocity is U of this small amount of mass coming out. And the net result of that is that this rocket maybe was moving at some velocity V before, and the equal and opposite reaction to this small one molecule coming out at velocity u is it's going to create some small incremental increase in velocity of the rocket motor v going in the other direction, right? Equal and opposite directions like Newton's third law, right? So this is actually what's going on to create our thrust within the rocket motor. So now what we need is a mathematical relationship of this force that we can use to actually figure out the parameters to design our rocket motor, and we're going to do that next, right? So let's take a look at that now. All right, so here, let's take some time zero, right? So P, P, our momentum at zero, right? What's that going to be? Well, it's going to be, this is before we our magic rocket motor that just kicks out one molecule, right? One molecule of gas, like we drew up before, at some velocity u, right? Um, and then, and, and you know, it's this thing's just going to kick out one molecule, right? So before we kick that molecule out, before we actually burn one molecule of fuel and oxidizer and create one molecule of gas with the heat that gets kicked out, the momentum that we're going to have there is just going to be the mass of our rocket motor, right? Times its velocity, right? Pretty straightforward. So that's easy, right? So P at zero is MV, right? What about over here, right? Well, here, at P at some time, we'll call it one, right? What's that one gonna be equal to? Well, that's gonna be equal to the new velocity, that, that incremental reaction to, to the small amount of mass going out at U, that's gonna be equal to V, right, plus that incremental change in velocity, we're gonna get dv, right? right? Time, so that's velocity, that's just, we've just taken our existing velocity and added the extra amount of velocity we get as the reaction to our little gas molecule going out here, right? To what our new mass is. Well, our new mass is gonna be what was m, right? But then we've lost this small molecule that's gone out the back end, right? So that's dm, right? There we go, right? Well, this is an algebra equation, and we can kind of work this out. So V times M, right? That's the M, right? There we go, right? And then we've got M times dV, right? So that's plus M times the small amount in velocity that changed, right? So we're just multiplying these guys. It's state algebra, right? And then we've got minus V times dM, right? Minus V times dm, right? Pretty straightforward. And then we gotta multiply the outside part here, so that's dv times minus dm, which is minus, right, dv dm. Now, think about this. This is like one molecule, and it's gonna be coming out of there, right, and the one molecule leaving this is gonna make a really, really small change in v. So a really, really small number times a really, really small number is an even smaller number. So we really don't need to worry about this component. It's really, really tiny small, right? So this is our momentum P1, right? So now we need to take our one P0, momentum that we did before, right? That's that's this one up here, right? That's, M, that's also MV or VM, right? 
and we need to subtract it, right? This was a plus sign, here, right? Right. Right. So we're now going to take this, and we're going to take basically we're going to take p1, what it was after we kicked the molecule out, and we're going to subtract p0, right? And that's going to be our change in momentum. Oops. Right. So what is that? Well. If we do that math and subtract that, Vm cancels, and what are we going to be left with? We're going to be left with m dv, right? Oh, I forgot to add this one. We did our conservation. I did this first part here. I took care of this. This actually describes this, but I forgot this one. So we also have to add in here the fact of the mo molecule we left out, and it's momentum is its mass times its velocity, right? So its mass was dm, right, times u, right? Right, so I forgot about that one in our, in our equation here. So what we're gonna get is what are we gonna get? We're gonna get, now we, we rock all these down, we're gonna do this subtraction like I did before. These cancel, right, that comes straight down. So we've got mdv minus v dm, right? Plus, and I'm just gonna swap since the multiplication, I'm going to call that u dm. It doesn't matter the order, right, with multiplication. dm u or u dm, it's the same thing, right? So if we rework that, what we come up with here is that basically our change in momentum is what? It's m dv, right, right, minus, or uh, no, m dv, what is it? Let's see here, make sure I get this right. Um, yeah, um, it's minus because we're subtracting out the amount that left because the sign is going in opposite directions. So it's minus u, right, minus v, right, dm, right? Okay, well, let's think about this. Now this, according to Newton, is our force. This is our thrust force here, right? right? But we know, since there was nothing coming from the outside system, this was all done internally, this net force is zero in the system, right? Which means that m dv is equal to u minus v, times dm, right? Right, well, m dv, right, if we integrate that, right, or actually, actually not integrate, but we, we take a look at that with regards to changing in time, so we divide both sides by a small amount of time, again, a small differential of time, what do we have, right? What we have is the mass times the change in velocity per unit time, which from our old model of Newton's second law is the acceleration, that is the force, which is equal to the mass times the acceleration, is actually equal to u minus v, u minus v. That's the difference. That's the rate, that's the difference in the velocity. And the difference, if this, if we were to take a relative position of sitting on the rocket here, Right? So we're going to sit on the rocket here and do our little measurement here with our, with our little radar gun. What we would see is that difference is actually the rate with which the gas, the velocity, is leaving here, right? right? Sometimes called the exhaust velocity. And so what we come up with is a relationship that basically says that the force of a rocket motor is equal to the velocity, this is getting kind of messy here, the velocity with which the exhaust is leaving times the rate of change of mass of the motor, right? right? So that's a little bit different than what we had before. So, so let's, let's talk about that. So what, I'm going to write it up here again, and we can kind of just summarize it because it kind of got a little messy there, but we can do it there. So what our conclusion where was is that force right, is equal to, what did we say it was? It was equal to the mass times the change in velocity over a period of time, right? Right, which we called, remember we called that 
in, in Newton's original version, that's acceleration, right? So F equals MA, so it does kind of come back. But in terms of a thrust equation, that's actually equal to the, velo the velocity of the exhaust coming out of the, end, out of the engine, that little molecule of, of matter, that gas molecule kicked out, its exhaust velocity times the rate of change of the mass exiting the engine, right? Right? And then in, in terms of rocket motors, they have a notation for this. They call it, uh, so we'll, we'll keep this as the exhaust velocity. And then we talk about a thing called M dot. M dot is the rate of change of mass going out of the end of the motor, right? So there you go. Uh, we now can describe a new relationship of thrust force, right? That's thrust. Our thrust force is equal to the exhaust velocity times the rate of change of mass going out of the engine, or out of the rocket motor. So there you go. So now we have a new rule for Newton's second law for a dynamically changing mass system for rocket motor, and uh, we'll pick this up in a second video uh, and actually talk about it, not in terms of the thrust we might see in space, where we don't have any, it's a vacuum, right? And this applies pretty much in a vacuum for a thruster uh, generating thrust in, in a vacuum, so if you're out in space. But when we're on Earth, we've got the atmosphere to deal with, and so um, our thrust equation and our thrust forces are a little bit more complicated, so we'll pick you up and see you in the next video.